Good morning, everyone. As most of you watching this or physically present here know, the Copyright X course um, has as one of its aspirations to put participants in a position to make informed, critical judgments concerning the shape of the copyright system. Most of the theories or arguments that are commonly deployed when shaping the copyright system depend upon assertions or assumptions about the nature of creativity. Broadly speaking, in the utilitarian vein, lawmakers will be trying to nudge actual or potential artists to create things that will benefit everybody else. Writers in other philosophic traditions, by contrast, will look for ways to reward or enable creativity out of a sense of um, moral obligation to the creators. But one way or another, pretty much all of the lawmakers and the advisors to lawmakers assume or assert conceptions of what creativity entails. Unfortunately, in the United States and in most other countries, rarely are these assertions grounded empirically, either in the strict sense of founded on surveys or in a more anecdotal or historical sense, meaning through conversations with creators. So we make some effort in this course to mitigate this recurring problem by, every year, asking some accomplished, prominent artists in some discipline to come talk with us and explain uh, what moves them. There's, of course, a limitation on this approach, which is there are no representative artists. There are just artists. So uh, we're not going to be we have not in the past asserted, and we will not today assert that the speakers are typical of their field. But at least it affords an opportunity to connect in a more genuine way with the fields of art that the law is trying to sustain. So each year we um, use a, we focus on a different genre. Um, this year is literature. Interestingly, you might think, why didn't we begin with literature? That would seem to be the heart of the copyright system. I'm not sure, to be honest, but we have finally come around to the core. And we have um, two wonderful speakers uh, to help us discuss the meaning of creativity in literature. So first, Akhil Sharma uh, is a uh, brilliant and powerful fiction writer. His um, path to here included an important academic trajectory. He studied at Princeton, where he worked with um, several creative writers, Russell Banks, Toni Morrison, Joyce Carol Oates, John McPhee, for some reason, I had the memory that you also worked with John Cheever. But it turns out he wasn't alive then, so that couldn't have been true. Um, but I somehow associate your writing with his stories. He then went to Stanford, where he had one of the um, justly famous in the creative writing field fellowships, the Stegna, Stegner Fellowship for Creative Writing. Then uh, worked for a while as a screenwriter. Um, and then interestingly, came to Harvard Law School for three years, after which he uh, went back into writing um, and now has re-engaged with the academic community. He is an assistant professor of creative writing at Rutgers. So an important 
academic path. But for our purposes here, much more important are his um, works of fiction. So in 2000, he published his first book, um, The Obedient Father. Um, and uh, then between mostly after that moment and uh, 2014, published many uh, short stories with prominent fiction publications, including um, the New Yorker and the Atlantic Monthly. Most recently, his second book, Family Life, on which he's been working off and on for a very long time, has come out. And pretty much every one of these uh, has received critical acclaim. So the Obedient Father received the Penn Hemingway Award. Um, uh, Family Life uh, was named by the New York Times as one of the 10 best books of the year, and in between, Akil has won many O. Henry awards for his short stories. So he's going to speak first, and then after Akil, Ron Suskind, who is equally accomplished in the field of nonfiction. So um, Ron, too, has a academic career, included an undergraduate program at the University of Virginia, where interestingly, Wikipedia reports that you lived on the lawn. So that, that must be the classic um, colonial experience. Yeah, OK, interesting. So then went to um, <laughs> Columbia uh, Journalism School, and then became a journalist, worked for the Wall Street Journal for quite a long time. And while there, produced, among other things, a extraordinarily influential series of articles about um, young men and women uh, in um, impoverished circumstances trying to move up and out. Um, a series of articles that won the Pulitzer Prize and then um, a, a little bit later found expression in his first book, um, a, hope, a Hope in the Unseen, which among other things has uh, figured prominently and appropriately in the debate about affirmative action ever since. So um, the success of this remarkable sort encouraged or enabled Ron to then move out on his own, where he has now written five more books. Most of them at um, ever higher levels about ever higher levels of the political establishment. Uh, so the price of loyalty focused on Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill. The 1% doctrine is about the um, Bush administration's foreign policy, and in particular, the um, increasing focus on threats to national security, either real or imagined. Um, the way of the world, um, same general field. Uh, the, the confidence men is about the financial crash and the way in which the Obama administration awkwardly attempted to address it. Uh, so as he moved up the hierarchy in politics, he um, gained more and more access to um, important political figures. So in particular, President Obama in the last of the books. Um, along the way, he um, has made, as any good political journalist makes, enemies. And uh, in particular, um, some, perhaps every one of his books, have revealed things about the events they've described that have made some political figures angry um, remarkably, that seems to not to have prevented him from gaining access to yet more political <laughs> figures. I can't resist, right? So his last book is actually, by chance, the one that I know the best because it relates to a project on which we've done some work together. Um, Ron's son, Owen, is autistic. And Ron has, with his wife Cornelia, developed a quite remarkable set of techniques for engaging with his son that implicates or depends in part upon occupation of the uh, 
personalities of the principal figures in the kinds of movies that his son watches, which tends disproportionately to be Disney movies. The reason why I happen to know some about this, aside from being a friend of Ron's, is that um, as everybody in the room and watching from afar knows, A, Disney is litigious, and B, incorporating in a new technique Disney characters at least presumptively, implicates copyright protection for those characters. So he is in the process now of developing this um, approach to communication with, engagement with people on the spectrum, and has written um, a powerful book called Life Animated about it. And there are going to be more um, manifestations of this initiative in the next year or two. So those are our two speakers. Um, Akil will speak first. The plan is for each of them to talk for about 15 minutes uh, concerning um, their own creative um, processes, life in the art, and, uh, and then we're going to have a discussion. So I have some questions I can pose that have already been submitted by some of you and some of the folks watching online. And, uh, Others, I hope, occur to you um, as we go along. Akil. Should I use this microphone? Or? Uh, you can just turn just, that one on. Oh, OK. Great. So my name is Akil Sharma. I, you know, I was thinking about uh, why I write. And none of the motivations for why I write are emotionally or mentally healthy. So I began writing seriously, that is, writing things with, uh, I mean, I used to, when I, was, when I was in junior high, I would plagiarize things, change a few things, and present them to my teachers and say I had written them. And I did this largely to get attention. Uh, I wanted to be considered a good writer, just to receive admiration, even though I was not a good writer, even though all the sentences in my paragraphs would begin with the. And at some point, I began to, I, you know, I grew up in New Jersey. I, uh, uh, let, me, let me step back. When I was growing up in India, uh, we, as little kids, we didn't take notebooks to school. We took a slate and we took chalk because paper was expensive. So I would have chalk in my pockets and by the end of the day, the chalk would have turned to powder. Uh, the, when we got our newspapers, we would clip the sides of the newspapers and save the unwritten scraps of paper to write on, to take notes and things like that in the family. And so for me, the only time there was an abundance of paper would be around Diwali, the Indian New Year, when people would receive calendars and diaries as presents. The, so for me, there was always a sense of status attached and wealth attached to, to paper. When I came to America, I mean, I didn't, we just didn't have any books in India, at least in my family. Uh, when I came to America, I just began reading a lot, and I began reading a lot with the idea, really, of erasing myself. Like I would read, um, sitting, at a, sitting in front of a TV, when the commercials came on, I would read. Uh, when the commercials ended, I would begin watching it. Uh, and what I wanted was, what I liked about, I just wanted to not be me. That's why I read. When, at, and at some point, you know, there were a group of nerdy children who all read excessive amounts of science fiction. And I was one of them. And we all sort of felt uh, that if you're reading all this stuff, you should be able to write, uh, which of course is not true. Just because you're a reader doesn't mean you can write. Uh, and I began my, little, my plagiarism. Then at some point, uh, I had thought that I would end up as an engineer or a doctor, just because that's what everybody in my family aspired, for, aspired to. At some point, I read this biography of Ernest Hemingway and I was reading, you know, I can remember where I was sitting when I was reading this. I was sitting at my kitchen table, 
it was early in the morning, like 6.30 in the morning, um, and the sun wasn't really out yet, and there was this real sense of, you know, the, as the light came on outside, as the lawn became invisible, I felt this growing sense that, holy cow, this guy got to travel around and have a good life without having to work. Like, I really did not want to work. You know, that was also a deep part of my, my nature. The, and so I went and I began to, uh, I thought, well, I don't need to be a good writer. I just need to be good enough. So I went, you know, so I went to the library and I bought, I rent, checked out all these books on Hemingway. And I read dozens of books about him, criticism about him, before I read anything by him. Uh, so I, my goal was simply, let me figure out how this guy does it and let me just copy it. You know, I'm not really interested in developing new things. I'm interested merely in the appearance of, of talent. I'm merely interested in the appearance of being gifted. So, and at some point I had read all these books and I went and bought the, his books, his actual fiction. And for me, it was an enormous thing because we just didn't, we had no money at all, no money. And so to spend 20 bucks or 30 bucks, whatever it was to buy all of his different books was a big thing. And I began reading him chronologically from, you know, In Our Time uh, and The Sun Also Rises. And I just found it unbelievably tedious. I couldn't, it, because he's such a plain writer, it's hard for me to respond to it. Uh, and at some, and because I, I felt that was my fault. I felt that I was not able, that there was something wrong with me that I couldn't appreciate him. And so I began, and I also felt really scared that, hey, I have spent my 20 or 30 bucks, which is all I have, and I have no other way of getting out of my life, you know, which is this, this thing that I don't want to do, which is become an engineer or a doctor. And so what I began doing was I began sort of crawling over the sentences. So I would write down the number of words in each sentence, I would circle the ands. I would circle where a comma should be and where, there, where it wasn't. I would look at dialogue labels in sentences and see when there was a he said and when there was, a sh uh, uh, when there was not a he said or a she said. So for example, most fiction is writ written in the past tense. Dialogue by its very nature has to occur in the present tense, right? When people are speaking, there it, it, it is present tense. There are two types of present tense. If you, so there's a present tense which, is, which has he said, she said, and that, that type of present tense reads a little bit faster because the, ex, the information being given out is much more stable. We as readers always know who is speaking. If you remove the dialogue labels, the he said, she said, the reader has to read much more slowly. And so the present tense, it becomes a different type of present tense. Uh, you know, it's a present tense where you're walking much more, much more slowly. It's like you're walking on ice. And so, you know, I became aware of these technical things. And at that point, I began to write. I had tried writing before, and I had only written about white people. I didn't know any white people. I had never been inside the home of a white person. Um, but it just seemed to me that, you know, white people were more important. And so, look, you know, you want to try to write about the things which are more useful, which other people are going to relate to. And so I wrote about white people. When I read Hemingway, the guy only writes about exotic things, right? He only writes about Spain or Italy. He only writes about bullfighters. He only writes about things in extreme situations. Uh, the reason being that, you know, if it's in, uh, you can write simply about uh, exciting things. Whereas if you write simply about boring things, you're going to be boring. Uh, and so it made sense. For it, he also, there, you can, when you read him, you can see how to write about exotic things, things which your audience won't uh, appreciate, won't know. Uh, so for example, the, the different relationships, but what it means for me to talk about my uh, mother's brother is what that means is different from what my relationship with my father's brother is, those two type of uncles. And I, don't know, I didn't know how to express it until I began reading Hemingway. And so I began writing and largely because I was writing about exotic things, right? And largely because around that time, the Indian community was becoming more important. Uh, I received a great deal of attention. You know, so 
the first stories that I published, I began, were stories that I wrote in high school and college. Uh, the, in my heart of, so I went to, I went to Princeton. Uh, in my heart of hearts, I just wanted to be safe. You know, I had grown up poor. I don't want to be poor. To me, uh, there's a great deal of fear to not being, a, not being able to afford things. And there's a great deal of humiliation that comes with it. Um, you know, my, I, I grew up with illness in my family. You know, I have an older brother who was very ill. And um, we had no money, and so we were always stealing things. Right, so whatever. So whenever my brother would be in the hospital, when we left, we would just take everything we possibly could and bring it home because we thought it would be useful, you know. So all these scissors, all these Q-tips, uh, and so that was my relationship to to you know money really meant safety to me. Uh, but I also, but side by side, I had no desire to work, just absolutely no desire to ever day do a day of you know sitting in an office working. I. So when I was in, in, in Princeton, I thought, how do I not work while making a lot of money? And I thought, you know what I should do is write screenplays. Because this is, uh, there's a lot of money attached to it. doesn't seem like a lot of work. Uh, and so I thought, well, what is the sort of stuff that would sell? And so I thought, you know, at that point, there were all these movies that were, that were made about Robin Hood or Last of the Mohicans. I thought, let me write some trash that's based on a big brand name and uh, which has a lot of violence. So I wrote a screenplay based on Beowulf, sold it, immediately moved to Hollywood, and began writing more trash. Uh, and, but you know, the, it's, a, it's not a good, for me, it wasn't a very good life uh, because you know, it's, so, it's so risky. Then I came to law school here, largely because I wanted to make a living. My first day, before I had even heard about, uh, even before classes had started, somebody told me that, hey, look, if you want to make a lot of money, you should be a banker. And so I said, all right, that's what I'm going to be doing. So while I was here, I took classes at the business school, and I went to, to classes at MIT. Never took the bar, went and became a banker. Uh, I remember coming here to do recruiting uh, when I was a banker and being being surprised that I had actually gone to Harvard Law School. I had, it just made no impression on me. Uh, and I, I don't say this in a mean way. It, was, it, was just, um, it just didn't matter to me, and largely, uh, you know, it, it, was not my, it wasn't a place that I should have been. I wanted to, you know, when I began writing, I wanted to, when I began to write seriously, when I began writing seriously in high school, I had a great desire to bother people. You know, I was unhappy, and so why should you get to, to be okay? Right? If, I'm gonna, if I'm unhappy, I'm gonna bother you and make you unhappy too. Uh, and so I began writing stories with this idea of generating effects. And then at some point, you know, you begin to fall in love with, the, you begin to fall in love with books, you begin to fall in love with, with literature, you begin to fall in love with the fact that what you're doing is something meaningful. I, um, and, you know, and my, mot there's a still a large part of me, which when I write, what I want is for the reader to not be able to look away, to have these experiences, uh, to not be able to deny the truth that the reader is reading. I, you know, I had thought when I wrote my first book, which Terry was my thesis advisor on, I wrote it as part of my, uh, my third year paper. Uh, and I still want, um, you know, a lot of why I write is just a desire for attention, you know, and a desire to, to be recognized and a desire for whatever is my truth to be recognized. Uh, I, des I write to be admired. I don't, I don't think that I write for, you know, I, do, I don't write for money. Like there's almost, 
because there's so little money attached to what I to what I write in literary fiction. So, for example, with my first novel, I sold 13,000 copies uh, in the U.S. You know, so my book never earned out its advance, and I spent nine years writing it. The it was when when it was excerpted in the New Yorker and in the Atlantic, and I, you know, when I went to meet these these editors, I thought that. Uh, you know, I would receive a lot of admiration from them. And what, what you instead realize is, holy cow, these editors deal with other writers who want admiration every single day. You're not the only schnook who's doing this to them. Uh, and I, my latest book took 12 and a half years. Uh, I wrote 7,000 pages. Uh, it's not even a long book, it's 225 pages. And I don't, the reason, I don't think I could have done it while holding on, holding a regular job. Uh, I largely, <coughs> my beloved wife subsidized me. That is, she went to law school and worked as a lawyer. Uh, the, eventually, I was able to get, a, get an academic job, uh, which allows enough free time for me to do my stuff. But I, you know, the, the motivation for every, for, I don't know if there has been that much of a change in me as a writer in terms of the primary motivations as to why I write, which are largely, you know, to, I have things, I, I want other people to feel things. I feel things, I feel alone with my feelings, and now I would like other people to feel these same things. I do, I, and I think that some, to some extent, this is a comfort to readers as well, that when they listen, when they read a book and they're affected by it, that they too are made less lonely. So, you know, it's very primal, all of this stuff that I, that I work with. And it's not psychologically healthy. I, for, at one point, for a year, I was on anti-anxiety medication. And immediately, I stopped wanting to write. I thought, I'm OK. Why should I do this stuff now? Uh, and then at some point, you know, I stopped using it, and then the desire to write came back on. Uh, but so, to me, it's also now at the point where I am in my career, it's a wonderful life, absolutely a wonderful life. Uh, largely because, partially because I get to do all this stuff that I enjoy doing, this writing. And partially, if you get to a certain point in your, uh, in your writing career, you get all these weird ancillary benefits. So for example, I like to write about luxury travel. Uh, so for, I went to Chile and went on the rodeo circuit. Uh, I went to Vietnam to golf. Uh, I'm, some Savile Row tailors are making suits for me. All of this, you know, I began to realize that at a certain point, anything you want, you can get for free. Uh, and so for me, the, the life of the writer has been a wonderful thing. Uh, but I don't think it would have been a wonderful thing if I was not getting all these nice little things on the side, you know, all these little trips, uh, all this wonderful other stuff. I'm happy to answer questions when, when we get to that period, uh, but that's sort of why I do this, do what I do. Thank you. I could just listen to you talk all day. Oh, extraordinary life. And I love the fact that he came through this place, too. You know, I know that I, I teach a class here called Public Narrative and Justice this semester. And I talk to lots of 3Ls. And, and some of them, I can see them as undergraduates. We're, we're pretty good at fitting words together. And I could sense that. Oh, yeah, I did pretty well in freshman English. And yeah, I took some writing classes as an undergrad. And now um, they say I, I do legal writing, which actually is not writing, I do not believe. That's a different thing. I don't know what it is, but it's different. Um, you know, I um, uh, have been at this for a long time in a very different path. Uh, uh, it comes from a, 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 a fundamental uh, and very familiar origin, is that I uh, was telling stories ever since I could talk, pretty much. 
you know, at the behest of a ferocious little mother from Brooklyn, pretty much said, you know, entertain the dinner guests and you will get dessert too. So I learned to do that. I learned to tell stories to groups of people. And then I was confecting stories. So I would sort of start in a little bit of the Isaac Dennison thing, you know, with a line and off I'd go. And that built a muscle somewhere in my neurology of fitting things together. Now, this is a muscle all of us have. You know, back when I'm doing this, you know, I was born in 1959, before any of you were, with a few exceptions. Uh, but, uh, but back then, we didn't really understand the way this little thing works between our ears of, of how uh, the brain uh, takes messy reality and is instantly on its left side, interpreting and shaping story. Just, it's literally, it's like we breathe. Because that's the only way we create coherence as we walk through the world. And as well, what they now find is the only way we actually remember anything. You know, reality is pretty noisy stuff bombarding our senses. And we pretty much only remember things that we craft in some way into story. I find that fascinating because it helps me understand what all of us do and what I was doing from a very young age. Now, at some point, through various twists and turns, I become a reporter. Uh, it's a long and fascinating story that I could tell on the stage if I had an hour, but, you know, but I decided what I would do, inspired, in fact, by a novel that this a person I was working with in a campaign gave me. I was, a, I was the campaign manager, she was the press secretary called Winesburg, Ohio by Sherwin Anderson, which is a seminal early uh, 20th century novel, kind of a, uh, you know, a progenitor of Hemingway and Faulkner and others. And, and this novel moved me. And, um, uh, and I began to think in a slightly different way. The, the, the person, this woman said, geez, you know, she actually looked at my law school application to get right down to it. I wrote an application, I think it was to Yale in those days, where I had to attach the meaning of life to being a writer in some way, which is obviously creative, to being a lawyer, which is obviously creative writing. And she looked at the essay and said, this is actually pretty well written, but it doesn't sound much like you want to go to law school. I'm like, really? She's like, no. But it's really nicely burnished. She was kind of a young writer. She says, have you ever thought about writing? I'm like, I, yeah, how would that work? It's like, well, you could be a reporter first. Lots of writers start that way. They walk around with a pad, talk to enough people that they learn enough, they have something to say. You know, Hemingway certainly did it, others. I said, all right, that's provocative. And so I wrote a Weinsberg-like reminiscence of my own college life, which was my writing sample to Columbia Graduate Journalism. That got me in. Um, things worked out. Actually, when I got an award at Columbia some years later, they asked me about that press secretary, where she now you know, she gave you such a nice steer in your life. Have you kept up with her? And I said, well, yeah, um, well, it's 2.30, so she's picking up the kids. I'll call her after the speech. It's Cornelia saw in me something that I did not see myself, which is the source often of relationships at work, if you have the wit to listen to them. So off I went with my pad, uh, doing what reporters do, talk to people. And I found they were fascinating because that little part of my brain was activating all the time, not just on my behalf to explain my messy reality rushing to me, but theirs. Like, this is where this person fits, and this is a lovely part of the story. And I started to fashion these things together as a reporter. Now, soon enough, after various twists and turns, I was finding editors were going, this is sort of more written than we thought, so please don't do that anymore. Just give me the pyramid style. You got a deadline at 4 o'clock. So I started to move on a kind of dual track as a traditional reporter who often was branching out to try to write more with a bigger W and, and exercise these muscles. And it all twists and turns through, as Terry mentioned, this series on inner city African American kids in a very blighted terrain, who one of whom goes to the Ivy League. And that's the series that wins the Pulitzer Prize. And it's very written. You know, you're really there to feel. Um, and I actually wrote it in an interesting way that gets to the source of this 
nonfiction effort where I was writing for the Wall Street Journal in a traditional way. The traditional way is after the anecdotal lead, about four graphs down on that front page story. You all know this from the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. And some of you, it's called a nut graph, a cosmic graph. It's kind of the why you ought to be here graph. Here's an important trend. And these things are occurring. And this is why this is significant. And now read on. Well, what I found was, um, I, was um, I was on a train from Connecticut to, to New York, and I had a front page story in the Wall Street Journal that morning. And on the 722 out of Fairfield, Connecticut, everyone's reading the journal. And there's a guy just across the aisle from me reading my story. And right about the fourth graph, he's, uh, he turns to something else. And I'm like, what happened? I went across the aisle, let's talk to me. He said, what, what? I said, no, I wrote that story. What happened? Well, that nut graph, I kind of know everything I need to know about that issue. I'm good on that. I said, huh, are you? So you didn't read the rest, another 2,000 words that I really worked hard on. Nope, I'm sorry. I'm on money and investing, the third section. That helped me think more clearly about how to tell stories that get across a kind of minefield of why bother, or I'm good on that, or I've already decided. And I know this character because I know him from or her from surface issues, and I'm good on them. And this is something that fits with issues of an increasingly tendentious society we live in, where you've got cardboard cutouts of all kinds on the landscape, inner city black kid and beleaguered teacher. You know, factory worker losing his job and CEO getting his bonus. We line them up nice and neat, creates conflict. Much of law emerges from some of this way of shaping narrative. Certainly our conversations of conflict, of rights, and how money and power is allocated. So I started to write a different kind of story where it just unfolded and you'd walk in the shoes of the character. And you weren't really sure what it was exactly about, but you kind of were interested in this person that you normally might not be interested in. And the general posit is that everyone's life is in its essence more or less identical to all other lives. Is that we all more or less want the same sorts of things, even though we seem so different from one another. And if I can spend enough time with them, and they'll let me in deep enough, I can find some of that shared spark of something, the shared human narrative that I think all of us carry, some of us, as we walk through the world. And that became the way I began to write. So after that first book, A Hope in the Unseen, with an ensemble of characters, which was a book about all sorts of things. I, uh, I started to, as a kind of public service, wrestle with presidents, who I sometimes was outraged by, and outraged by living in Washington, how little sort of happened in government with all the sweeping ideals. And so I created a different kind of narrative, which was an ensemble narrative where you often would have a famous person, like a president, and an ensemble of characters in a kind of conversation with one another, the notables and the unknowns, all moving through present tense side by side. I like present tense, by the way. It's more immediate. It seems to have breath. And that became the next four books. And it, of course, was heartbreaking that the news cycles and the push and shove of me versus George W. Bush or me versus Barack Obama got so noisy in an age defined more by message than anything else. I was the enemy of message. And they said, well, we've got to do something. You know, we'll just, we'll just make as much trouble as we can for this book so people have you know, have a moment of doubt rather than us being revealed. No, it doesn't really work. The books have held up beautifully. But, you know, all those characters that I love were eclipsed in many cases. And that was hard. 
I have no complaints. The books all debuted at one or two or three in the Times bestseller list. So I, I've, I'm a lucky guy. And what drove them off was what Obama said or what Bush said and how that drove news cycles. That was the engine. And along the way, people sat and read about real lives of real people. Now, how do you do this? Well, you've got to sort of do a kind of truth therapy with them. That's where the creative process takes hold. You know, you've got to be authentically interested in them. You can't be sitting there going, when do I get what I need so I can go home? You can't be product oriented. They, they suss you out. They're looking for that. And so I spend an inordinate amount of time with people, years in some cases, just being with them. They often say the most interesting things when no one seems to be noticing. Eventually, they find out as much about me as I know about them. It's not one way, it's two ways. Why should it be different? And they say some things that are often hard. Life is a teacher you can trust without question. All of its lessons are worth keeping. And sometimes they'll tell me the deepest stuff. And when you get that, it's something you have in your hand which is just so precious. It's the essence of a person. Something they may not even tell their husband or wife or child. And then what do you do with that? That's at the source of the creative process. What are then your obligations? Your obligations are to present that fully in the context of their life. Context is a bit of a tricky word. Context means as their life is, as they see it. And I have a rule. I have a rule that I, that I embrace sometimes, well, against my will, but it's one that works, is that people do what they do for good enough reasons. It's, this is not you know, some sort of moral relativism either. They may not be your reasons or mine, but they're good enough that intent flows to action the thing you can see. Know those reasons, even if some of them are repugnant to you. And you can know a person almost as well as you can know another. You understand why. Why they do what they do and live the life they live. And then you get to a place where you can take that essence and craft it into a story where you feel their breath. And I say, look, if I know everything, and I need to know everything, you will create a kind of spell, you the character, that you'll reach off the page. I'll vanish. The reader will feel like they're with you, even though they may never have met a person like you in the divided countries in which we live, or experienced what you have lived. And when that happens, it has an extraordinary effect, where people stop seeing them and us, and they start seeing at least the fabric of we, and something that they say, wow, that changed my morning, or my day, or the way, the way I see, maybe now with what Proust would call new eyes, just a little, and then you go back to your life. And so that's the thing that I try to do. Now, in terms of the final issue before I sit down of what is this creative process? You know, at the heart of creativity is theft, always. You know, Einstein has that line. I don't know if it's true, but it's on T-shirts. You know, the, the key to creativity is knowing how to hide your sources. We all have sources. We all need to draw from them Others work, Hemingway, whomever, others' lives, others' experiences, and that's what nourishes us. And if you can create something that's transformative from that, that goes beyond them, and also in a way houses them and places them in a wider human pageant, you've got something someone might buy. But make no mistake, we're nothing without the theft. It's just the way all of us live lives with significant derivations in everything we do.
The key to it is to create something that at least carries the, the rhythm, the feel of different. Larger, your voice, something that feels fresh and new to someone or someone who feel like they've seen everything already. That's a tension in this equation. And the key is, at the end, is when the subjects read it. Some of them are unsettled. Jesus, you put that in the book. I said, I told you I was putting it in. But yes, yes, but I didn't think about that. I mean, we were talking, it seemed, in private. It was like therapy. Then all of a sudden, you hit a little button, and we were doing it in the Superdome. And it was getting broadcast to the planet. I said, but just, just, I said look. You and I talked early, and you agreed about a fundamental truth, a fundamental verity, and it's that you've got to trust truth. Trust it. It's all that works in any parts of your life that currently work, yeah? It's all we have at the end of the day. That we work so furiously on presentation and on message and what people will think that I will make them think with what I project. There are truths that define lives. And you signed on here because you believe that that truth is valid. And it's going to get messy when everyone knows it, but you'll feel better. You already feel better, really, don't you? And they do, on ex in extraordinarily high percentages. Not all immediately, many immediately, but then eventually. And so that's. That's the thing that I do. Um, and it's creative. But it also is drawn from people and loving why people do what they do and having them tell you the deepest things uh, in their hearts. So. Three of us move up here. As I mentioned um, at the outset, I have some questions that have been sent in in advance, but I hope that these wonderful presentations have been sufficiently provocative to prompt some reflections and questions of your own. Stephen. I wonder if you could comment on Mr. Suskin's uh, observation that the heart of creativity is depth. If you feel like you also draw from other people's works, like Jamie Oh. I, I only know what a story is because I've read other stories. And so that's certainly true. I only know what the effects of a certain technique is because I've seen this, this I've experienced the effect in other people's stories. So the, when I was talking about the two types of present tense and dialogue. Uh, so I, I, would, I would agree with that. Um, the, I mean, one, yes, I mean, so I think that's, that's accurate. Like I don't, I'm sure I can make some sort of argument in opposition, but I would just be making an argument for argument's sake. I have no further comment. <laughs> um, I have a question, but I actually don't even know if my question is correct because I'm trying to work it out in my head. Um, and uh, if one looks at the concept of innovation, um, and um, is, is something new created at the moment it's created and then it becomes open source? Or, and I'm not speaking like a lawyer, um, or does some process happen uh, where we 
Well, I know the legal process, but is there a process that changes it into open source in a way that's automatic? I think I'm trying to work in my head something about creativity. And I know my question sounds weird because that's what I'm grappling with. Mm. Um, well, I mean, I think, um, I think we're living in a time where we do, with, we do with a lot of company when we create things with open source, um, and I don't know, I mean, you all are the experts, certainly Terry, um, about some of the complications of that. Um, I will tell you that, just a little aside, is that there are moments now that, with this last book I've created, this company, and it was just a bit of an experiment, and I probably will write about it someday, but you know, there are moments where someone says something provocative, and a little bell goes off, and I'm saying, oh, whose IP is that? Now, it's obviously in the company, but you know, it, gets, it gets complicated. I think what I do as a writer, though, and, and Kiel, you probably agree, is you know, we spend a lot of time alone. Most of our time, I spend an enormous amount of time writing these books by myself, isolated, really. I build up all the notes and the tapes, and then I go off to actually our lake house in Vermont, and just my wife says, don't come back till you're done, because I don't want to see you. Until you're finished, and it's solitary, um, and, and it's about digging deep into yourself, and then suddenly, or sometimes, you get something that takes shape. Um, sadly, I tend to write my best stuff between 2 and 5 a.m., <laughs> which is why I look the way I do at this age. He's actually 24. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just out of here. Yeah, graduated about a year ago. Yeah. You know, when I, uh, when, I was, when I began writing Family Life, my most recent book, I asked my, my parents' permission because I was drawing heavily on my own life. And when I talked to my mother, she, she said, Akhil, just make me look good. And then when I was talking to my father, my father doesn't read, nor does he believe that anybody else reads. Right? So if you were to tell him that you had read a book, he would think you were showing off and trying to make him feel bad. Uh, and so he said, Akhil, if you want to keep a secret, put it in a book. And oh, the, God. <laughs> the, you know, when we think about where, when I write something, I, you know, I, it's weird. Like, I'm a, you know, when Ron writes a book, it's a, a book that's going to be on the front page of the New York Times, right? It's not a book. It's not a book, just a book that's going to be reviewed in the book pages. It's a book that's going to generate news, right? So it's a book that's going to sell half a million copies, a million copies. Whereas when I write a book, uh, you know, if I'm lucky, 30 or 50,000 people will read it, if I'm lucky, if I'm lucky. And so I, I, when I write a book, I work from the assumption that almost nobody will read it. And to the extent that it has any effect, it'll, it'll be with other writers. And when another writer reads something, hmm. you know, I am, re I am writing with the idea, if I'm writing it for other writers, and I am, uh, then it is with a desire to be admired by them and with an awareness that they will see that I have copied things you know, from other people you know, that there are techniques that I have taken from other writers, and if they find an effect interesting, they will try to replicate it. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when you read War and Peace, one of, the, one of the effects you oftentimes have is this sense of floating, like you're everywhere in the room. And the way that he generates this effect is that he has a third-person point of view looking at a character from the outside. He switches into the interior point of view of that character in in a paragraph after that, and then he pulls out with the third paragraph. And the rapidity of that move generates that effect. And so I assume that other writers are going to read this thing and see what they can lift. And so I approach it with that, ad, with that response. Uh, and so I, I think that's vaguely tied to what, your, what uh, your question is. But it's a very different, what I do is a very different beast from uh, 
somebody who, you know, your books are going to be on the front page of the New York Times. You know, it's a different beast. It's going to be, people are going to be talking about in the news. You, it's a very, very different sort of thing. Can I just say that, you know, but, but the characters I write that people don't notice but feel and yeah. like, oh, that's an inner city black kid and I'm feeling them are more like your characters. Right. Um, and a lot of the, but you're right. I, I mean, the thing I would say is that you, you've got to kind of think beyond some of our yardsticks of marketplace, because the fact is, is that civilizations, you know, are captured and, and in a way preserved in the what becomes the artifact of, of literature. You know, even if in the time and place that literature is maybe finding a modest readership, that's the thing that will centuries hence be often turned to as defining. I believe that. Um, you know, it, it's different. It's different. You can get at more that sums up a people, the human experience, the complexities of what we feel and think in fiction than almost anything else. And I think that line of books like Akil's books will be the things that people capture and look back on centuries or many years from now as opposed to days in which they fade. One of the um, questions from one of the Copyright X students is related to this. Um, so Anmol Patel in um, the online course writes from India says, is your creation of a fictional work in any way affected by your apprehension of the perception of your work by your readers? Now, I'm inclined to elaborate the question a little bit. Um, as you've both just explained, the um, size and nature of your audiences, if defined as the people who are gonna read it in the next year or five years, is different. Mm -hmm. But each of you also has a view it seems, both of you have alluded to the possibility of other audiences, future audiences. You know, so Melville was in your position, as you describe it, of relatively modest readers currently. Mm -hmm. But um, he, partly in a spirit of bitterness, was increasingly toward the end of his writing career oriented toward the future. And then there's this, like Hill, you mentioned a minute ago, other writers. Mm. Um, there is awkwardly, perhaps by necessity, a um, parallel issue in, to the extent legal writing is writing, um, issue <laughs> uh, in which legal scholarship is rarely read by anyone other than mm -hmm. other law professors. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're writing ostensibly to the world at large, but not really. You're writing to your scholarly peers. So those would be variations on the theme that um, Anmol Patel poses. So I'll repeat the question, is your creation of a fictional work, or in your case, non-fictional, in any way affected by your apprehension of the perception of your work by your readers? I mean, for me, um, I'm aware that, you know, so my first book is about a 58-year-old child molester. Right, and uh, I'm aware that uh, if I begin having this guy trying to fondle his granddaughter in the first page, many people will not keep reading it. And the, seri the things that I am seeking are complicity, so that the reader will get to a point when they can't avoid it, when they will be dragged along unwillingly into, into the world that I want to take them. And so my awareness as to my, how my reader is responding. I'm, I'm very aware of it, you know, in the same way that I'm aware that if I start with a short sentence, it might read fast, right? And so I need to create something which, you know, in the same way that I'm aware of how a sentence is working, to the extent that I'm aware how a sentence is working, I'm aware of my reader. If I'm aware of my reader on a sentence level, I'm certainly aware of them in terms of how they're reacting to sort of bigger picture things. But I would assume that you're also very, uh, very- Intensely yeah. aware of them. I think about them all the time. I think about crowded rooms of people suffering from ADD mm -hmm. at a vast level. I don't want to lose them. 
I, I've watched them on the trains. They, they're fickle, <laughs> they're gone, and the capriches are gone in a minute. And so I'm constantly thinking about what does that reader, and defining the reader is important too, because there are lots of different kinds of readers. But I try to define it pretty broadly, and I'm thinking about what does that reader see when they look at this character? You know, okay, I got to be very clear eyed on that, because in a way, I'm trying to hook them too. Mm -hmm. To not say, oh, I know about inner city black kids with dads in jail. I'm done with that. And all of a sudden, there's a moment where this character says something that the reader's going, hmm, that's not what I'd figure. That's good. And the twists and turns are the same ones that work in terms of stories we tell. If the story is too neat and too predictable, they're gone in a minute, your audience. So you're trying to hook them in. And I think about that all the time. And, the, and what's interesting is that, is that the first book, which was very much more pure narrative, and the last book about my son, which was as well, in a way, those, those books I'm sure will last long, mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to the bigger books in the middle, uh, mostly about presidents and perfidy in America and the world. Um, but it's by hooking readers and saying, you're sticking around, I'm gonna get you right to the last page. And thinking about that every minute, are they, am I losing them here? Too much on this, mm -hmm. cut it. Mm -hmm. This doesn't have rhythm, cut it. That's the key to storytelling or writing like Akil does or I try to. Or, or what will remain of even books that are history oriented will be your capacity to tell stories within stories. Yeah, absolutely, so. absolutely. You know, you, you, you got, that's the creative process. You literally are thinking, is this reader with me on this page? And if they're not, you got to rewrite the page, pretty much. And it's, and it's 7,000 pages, it's all rewriting. There's no such thing as writing, it's all rewriting. E.B. White is clear as a bell on that. You just rewrite and rewrite. Hone it, tighten it. It's, it's, it's painful. But when it works, you write a beautiful sentence. You're like, <laughs> I, I can sleep at four in the morning now, maybe. And, you know, and an awareness of what your audience is determines what, how you write. So for example, if I'm writing with the sense as to, okay, I'm writing with, for other writers, or I'm writing with, uh, with the books that made me want to write in mind, that means that there are lots of things that I will not write, I will not do. So there are certain types of description I won't do. I won't telegraph certain things. Uh, more, you know, I'll hold back. Uh, there are all these weird things that you won't do just because they, they are the indications of uh, cliche or they're, they're the indication of having done things that are done too easily. It's interesting, I, you know, so for me, I really love having a nice life. I love that stuff, right? And so I write about luxury travel and so my, my editor was telling me, for the Financial Times, was telling me that, you know, I write too subtly. Uh, and so he said, you know, because if you make a point here, the reader will not pick that up, that remember that point two paragraphs later. And so the easiest way to fix that is to put in a clear sentence reminding them that that will feel manipulative to me. Uh, and so what I have to then do is invent basically a persona for whom these sort of jumps and transitions will feel accurate. I don't know if that's making sense. I have to invent a personality for whom that voice is accurate. Most readers won't notice whether or not the voice is authentic. Um, they'll only be aware of, hey, do I, am I being reminded of this paragraph from this point from two paragraphs ago? Uh, but for me as a writer, I need to go, I need to do these things which are not necessary. Uh, otherwise, I'm not doing, otherwise I feel like I'm cheating. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I do a thing where um, I, I have a, I'm a little, I'm not morbid on this, but I, I sometimes late at night, I think about, you know, if I, if I walk out and get hit by a bus, and tomorrow morning, how is this for my last day? <laughs> I know, it's weird. But I think about that. 
It's the last thing he wrote. How was it? Was it worth that day? You know, these are the tricks you play on yourself. You know, and I think this notion that someone would read this after you're gone is, you know, enlivening. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's your voice will be carried beyond this. Um, and someone might pick it up and go, oh, look at this. I'm meeting all these people, these characters. They're speaking to me. Um, I feel like that's something that, that drives us along with vanity. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question for Mr. Suskin. Um, I'm wondering how you think about your um, responsibility to tell someone else's story, like particularly in A Hope in the Unseen, where you're really like inside someone's head. And yeah. at what point does your subject's story become your story? And you've spoken a lot about your subjects as characters. And so how do you yeah. like handle that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So did you read Hope in the Unseen in high school or something? Yeah. Yeah, it's a big high school book. Um, so. Uh, well, there was a moment that goes right to Akil and the two of us and what we do, different yet the same. So it's a, it's a short story, but it's a funny one, and it's interesting. So when I wrote the beginning of A Hope in the Unseen, the first 100 pages, or 80 pages, a lot of it was a recasting of what I'd already written in the, in the journal series, some of it. And, um, and then, but then the last part of it, where Cedric, the protagonist, the inner city African-American kid who graduates from high school at the end of this sort of 80 pages, um, at the graduation. Uh, and I know these characters, I've known them for years at this point, I know them so well that when Cedric looks out into the audience and I'm sitting next to Barbara's mother and she looks back, I, I know what's in her head. I check later, of course, but I'm pretty sure, and I'm right. So when I write this part, I bring it up to Random House, and there's an ad. This is my first book. So, you know, in these books, you know, you're totally naked here. You know, you've never written a book. It's, you know, you're hanging way out there. You know, it's you. And, and does it suck? It sucks. It's you. And so I'm there with the editor and some deputies, and I said, so what would you think? And he's like, well, we really liked it. I said, uh-huh. Okay. Any parts you loved? Any even? Any? <laughs> I'm like, I need love. You know, maybe I wasn't breastfed as a kid. I don't know. I need the love here. Bring me some love. And he's like, this one part we love, the graduation scene. I'm like, okay. He's like, this is different. You nonfiction guys don't do this. This is more like our fiction people. I'm like, and this is a guy who handled major fiction writers as well as nonfiction. The editor, great guy, John Sterling. And uh, I said, really? He said, yeah, yeah, you're right in their heads. And it's quite authentic. And it feels real. And you, ch I, yeah, I checked it with him later. Yeah, it is. He's like, huh, oh, this is different. So here's our question. Can you write the whole book like this? I'm like, wow, how do I report that? And that means like four times as much reporting. So I not only have to write down what I hear that's happening, see, he said to her, but I have to talk to them later about what's going on in their heads. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I guess, yeah, wow. He's like, and of course you're going to have to get rid of the Casper the Ghost quotes. Now, that's where lexicon for a reporter talking to a source or a subject with their back to the camera and they speak in a quote. Who's taking the quote? That can create complications because you always get the presence of the reporter, which kind of messes it up. I said, all those quotes are gone? That's like most of my quotes. Yep, they're all part of what will flow into internal speech their feelings. That was a big change. So that's the way I did the book. And, and the Chicago Tribune called it the new, new nonfiction, saying this is different. It's novelistic in ways they, we haven't been up to now. And, but it works because the, 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 the nonfiction writers out of the equation. The characters are talking right to the reader. They're walking beside each other, just like in a, a book by Akil. Or they don't mention a kill specifically. So, um, so that's that was the big change. Now, then the question is, am I being true to all of that? That's a lot. And does my own impression of them infect how I then present them? It's complicated, and I basically just go back at them again and again and again and say, is this true to your experience? To try to bleed out what I might have been thinking that infected it. 
and it just takes a lot more work. But when it hits, it works because the characters live in a way that they tend not to, sometimes, but tend not to in nonfiction. And people ask Barbara and Cedric for Hope of the Unseen, is it you? Is this, you know? And they say, it's me. But it takes a long time to get there. It's, you can't do that quick. I have a, a related follow-up question for both of you. It concerns the role of editors. So broadly speaking, all right, well, this is a hypothesis. You're going to tell me if the foundation is wrong. But it seems that editors are uh, fading in terms of their influence. They're fading in the broadest sense of um, they have less power than they used to, um, in part because they're expensive and publishers have less money now. Um, they're also fading in the, um, in the sense that increasingly, because of information technology, opportunities for communicating in writing directly without the medium of an authenticating publication are increasing. And to the extent editors are housed in those authenticating publications, they're fading. And finally, I'm guessing, just a guess, they're fading for you individually because as you become uh, more prominent and accomplished, editors have less clout in, in telling you what they think you should be doing. Now, if all that's true, if that's true, the question is, what does it cause or implicate? So one possibility is that editors could, could have traditionally been intermediaries between the artist and the market. Uh, actually, both of you, in your fascinating presentations, have referred to circumstances in which what you are trying to do is different from what you're getting paid for. And um, somebody's got to do this ad adjustment to get them sufficiently in alignment so that you're happy and keep writing, but they sell enough books. So if editors fade, that intermediary role might fade. Mm. Another possibility implicated by a comment or question posed by um, Stephanie Rochi uh, in one of Ben Hopper's section, in Ben Hopper's section, says, um, do you find it difficult to edit your drafts, especially when there's a part you really like, but maybe it's not necessary? So um, editors chop things up. Like, I'll bet you would not have removed all those quotes without the pressure. No, the guy, the guy turned me in a whole new direction. And, I, and the book would not be the book it is, and I would not have learned what I did unless he was there. So You're right you about all the things you said, by the way, and a lot of writers now hire their own editors because they can't get one anywhere else. If they can, or they just find friends to do it. I mean, it's, you're right about all the market forces and, and the disintermediation that the editors once, uh, the role they filled, uh, just shrinking. You, the, um, so for a short story, short stories are different than books. So with a short story, people largely will not buy it unless the story is already almost done. Because why should they take on work when they don't have to? So they will, if there's a last couple of tweaks, they'll be happy to step in with advice about that. But there's just no reason for it. They're getting such a flood of material every day. Like the New Yorker is getting 700 short stories every single day, right? So they don't, they don't want your mediocrity, right? Um, so almost all the editing has to be done before it arrives at their desk. So to a large extent, there isn't need for it or room for it right? in fiction. Uh, I'm not sure how it would work in, with nonfiction. With a, there's certainly, uh, with fiction, the, people are publishing their fiction on, online. Um, I don't know who reads it. You know, there's a, there's a joke in uh, Enemies, a Love Story, this novel, where this bookstore owner says that, uh, mentions to somebody that she leaves her store uh, unlocked. And the man says, oh, uh, the man she's telling this to says, oh, aren't you afraid that people are going to break into it? 
And she said, you know, my fear is that some writer is going to break in and leave his books. <laughs> and then I was talking to a bookstore owner, and she told me that that's an actual problem. <laughs> you know, that all these self-published writers come in and leave their books, uh, hoping that somebody will read it. So the, to, to a large extent, with fiction, you need the validation of, uh, of, a, publishing, of a publication. It just, that's the only way you're really going to get, uh, anybody's going to bother reading you. With books, mostly my experience has been that uh, editors will only acquire a book if, it is, if they're very confident that they won't have to do an enormous amount of work. Um, because just, that's just not the nature of what they're doing anymore. Uh, I've been... But I've had editors do a lot of work, you know, really an enormous amount of work on the, and give very good advice. Um, but that's not, that's not the, that's not typical. I mean, and also, I, again, with fiction, I just don't know why anybody would read my particular book when they could be reading Thomas Hardy. You know, there's already great fiction out there. Why, what is my value? Uh, when you can read Thomas Hardy. And the only way to get that, even a chance of getting read, is if you are, if there's some, somebody saying that this is valid and that requires a major publication. So um, both of you talked about sort of the obligations you have to your readers and the obligations you may have to your subjects. And I was just wondering um, what obligations you might have to yourself and your identity that might influence the, um, or shape your own creative process. Great question. Dave. Great finishing question. Can you go on the road with us? Uh, we're, we're doing Des Moines and Cleveland next. Um, and, uh, that's a great question. Um, what obligations do you have to your own identity? Um, uh, okay, so uh, a lot, you know. I mean, you're thinking about it a lot. I said, you know, I joke around. You're kind of naked out there because you're trying to do something, and sometimes you fail, and um, and, and sometimes, you know, I get to hide behind my characters because they're real people. Akil can't do that so much. He's more of an artist. He, it's just there. Um, and, and that helps give me some distance, I suppose. Um, in my last book, it is memoir as well, though. So I'm feeling now a, a great weight on this issue of identity because I didn't just go out in public. I've been in public for decades, but I brought my family with me. And it was a group family decision, but... You know, we all are out in public now, and, and our whole life is exposed. And, um, you know, at the beginning, I think we all felt fear of what would people think. And um, I think now, two years since The Life Animated was published, I think we feel um, a kind of heartening affirmation that people are up to complexity. The reader is up to it. If you, if you trust complexity, too. Or we all live pretty complicated lives, but we all know what a life looks like. You got one, we all have one. And that, you know, and that people will understand your good enough reasons if you get them all in there. When you hold one back, or many back, people go, mm, it doesn't really add up. They don't know why, but they know that. And so I think that, that having told sources forever, as I present them to the public, trust truth, now turning those hot lights on myself, having to, having to own it, um, actually has been more affirming than some of my fears uh, allowed, I suppose. I was concerned, but I'm not so much anymore. And more importantly, my family is not. And that's now our identity. You know, People will see you. And if they let them see you, they will know you. And you're probably going to be fine, no matter what, in many cases. So, You know, I don't read reviews. Uh, I don't uh, Google my name. Um, and so I feel 
quite able to say almost anything and act as if there's no consequences. You know, and of course there are consequences or there must be consequences to it. Um, you know, I, lots of readers are not sophisticated. So for example, if you write about a child molester, they think, hey, what's wrong with this guy? Uh, you know, I, for me, getting to write the things that I write is an enormous pleasure, an enormous satisfaction. Uh, and so I take care of myself. You know, I am by doing the work that is meaningful to me. And to the extent that this work is public, that it is seen, the fact that it is seen means very little. The, you know, a friend of mine who's very successful, much more successful than I am, said that somebody came up to him and said, you know, the, your book, which won the Pulitzer Prize, your book and The Hunger Games are the two best books I've read this year. <laughs> and you know, it's a, these are meaningless statements. You know, it's a, I mean, the praise that people give is meaningless and the, the criticism they give is meaningless. Uh, so it's just best to not, I just try not to, you know, people, when people try to talk to me about, I just try not to engage. You know, it's not my, I don't really care. You know, what you're saying doesn't matter to me, so please don't bother me. Uh, that's really my, my approach to most people. I can't manage that. I admire that. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks.